Okay, fantastic. Um, we are streaming live on YouTube and we'll just get started in um, about one minute. Thanks a lot, Matthew, for um, agreeing to be our speaker today. We're really looking forward to it. I think we can wait a couple of minutes um, just for people to join. So just let me know if I should start or if you say something before. I'll introduce you in just a minute, Matthew. I'm just going to give people one more minute to, to join to join some latecomers. Thanks a lot. We definitely always have stragglers, but maybe um, before we get officially started, um, I just want to uh, let all of you know that we will be taking a break for a bit. Um, but that the Sun Migration Seminar Series will be returning. Um, it'll either be this summer, uh, possibly not until the fall. Um, so we're going to probably have some organizational changes and, um, you know, things, things are a little bit up in the air, but I think we've built a really wonderful community of, of, of people and, um, and a lot of people are interested in continuing. So, um, so we do plan to do that. Um, so I'm going to drop my email in the chat for everyone, and I just want to say please feel free to reach out to get in touch um, if you have feedback or suggestions, if you're interested in getting involved, um, if you have a, a, you know, a suggestion of someone to invite to this series, um, we'll also be uh, accepting abstracts um, for people who want to present their own work. Um, so, so yeah, so just please feel free to, to be in touch and we'll think a little bit if we're going to keep going in the same way that we've been doing or if we'll do some restructuring or what exactly that looks like. But it's been a year now that we've been doing this, um, thousands of hours of people watching these talks and, and um, I think we've all learned a lot and it's been a lot of fun. Um, so it's going to be a hiatus, but it's not forever and I hope that when we return all of you will be back um, watching and, and learning with us. And so with that, um, I think Adam can go ahead and um, introduce our speaker. Thanks everyone. Thanks, and just to add to that, thanks to all the speakers who have, who have spoken in the series um, this year and for everyone for coming. Um, so our last speaker of the spring is uh, Mathieu Piel. Uh, Mathieu is a group lead at the Institut Curie and the Institut Pierre Gilles de Jean in Paris. Um, his lab uses a combination of quantitative microscopy, microfluidics, and cell biology to study the effects of cell deformations due to cell confinement, uh, particularly on the context of cell migration, cell growth, and division. And his re recent interests of his team have been in the deformation of the cell nucleus, the regulation of the cell size, and micro migration under confinement. And today he's going to be talking about a percolation transition in the actin cortex controlling motility of blebs and fragments. Thanks, Mathieu. Okay, thank you. Thank you a lot for this invitation. <clears throat> I'm happy to share this, uh, this, this work, which is uh, so some recent work performed by Juan Manuel Garcia Arcos in my lab with a PhD student who just uh, defended a few months ago. And we're putting that together. So yeah, I'm just yeah. We I, we'll see how it goes. I'm trying to present this in a 
it's a bit for the first time in this uh, format. And I will try to yeah, show you how we were able to understand some thing we think is important uh, uh, for cell migration uh, by looking closely at these uh, blebs uh, and uh, observing this tr percolation transition in, in the actin cortex. So we've been working for, for now quite some years uh, with um, immunologists, Anna Maria Lennon Dumenil and Pablo Vargas at Institut Curie and with a theoretician Raphael Voiturier. And our motivation is really to understand how these cells that you see here, these green little dots uh, move. Uh, these are immune cells moving in, uh, in the skin of uh, mice and you have the lymph vessels in blue here. And so they are uh, moving in this very complex environment, performing important tasks for the immune system. And we've been trying to study them in simpler environments. So there is this classical environment of collagen gels. That's what Pablo Vargas has been doing a lot uh, in the past years. We introduced some uh, even simpler environments by using microfluidic channels. Here you can see some dendritic cells which are passing small constrictions and deforming their nucleus, which is green in this movie, through these little holes. So I will not talk about that today at all, but it's been really introducing us to the, really the world of the nucleus. Um, and uh, also here you have even something even simpler, which has just ad adhesive lines printed on a, on a glass substrate. So we started that uh, now a long time ago with Manuel Terry, uh, and we used it also to understand some properties of migrating cells. And one thing we did a little bit by chance initially was to, to just squeeze cells between two plates. I mean, actually, people studying immune cells have been doing that for a long time. Um, and uh, we observed this, this quite striking transition to a fast migration mode where cells look like sausages. Um, and we, in these sausages, are actually large blebs. And so that's really what I will talk about today. Um, so our initial questions to, to confine cells between uh, two plates really came from this distinction between two types of cells, which are in, in the cell migration community always referred to as mesenchymal and amoeboid. Uh, and often considered to be really two separate worlds. Uh, mesenchymal cells are slow, they adhere on surfaces, they form focal adhesion stress fibers, like fibroblasts, uh, certain cancer cells. And then uh, amoeboid cells, which are typically immune cells, they move fast, they like to be confined, they don't really form focal adhesions of st or stress fibers. And so, uh, the, the, yeah, sorry, the two parameters which seem important in these uh, distinctions are whether cells are dear or not and whether they're confined or not. So we developed this device to confine cells and control at the same time whether they are dear or not. Uh, so we use this sort of a piston which can be moved down and below the piston you have micro pillars which define the height at which cells are squeezed. We used it in a lot of different works over the years. Um, and we also treated the, 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 the two surfaces of the, by which the cells are, are confined with molecules which allow to control adhesion. So a molecule that prevents adhesion, which is polylysine PEG, and the molecule that allows adhesion, which is the same molecule with a RGD peptide. So you can have this sort of sets of situations, cells which are adherent or not, and confined or not, basically. And by playing with a large number of different cell types, uh, we could find that actually mesenchymal and amoeboid cells are not like really two different worlds. You can take mesenchymal cells and make them behave like amoeboid cells. And you have this sort of phase diagram depending on confinement and addition. Basically, your mesenchymal cell is mesenchymal in this adhesive and non a uh, confined state, but the same cell, if you confine it in a non-adhesive environment, behaves like uh, amoeboid cells, and actually its speed can be increased by a factor of uh, almost 100 times. And it starts to move very, at speeds which are very similar to immune cells, actually. Uh, so when we looked more closely at these uh, fast-moving mesenchymal cells, we observed this sort of 
transition to this. Uh, so that's one type of amoeboid uh, migration induced by confinement, where cells develop a large bubble, blep, and then their shape changes and they start to be driven by the motion uh, of uh, these, by, by these uh, large blebs, large stable blebs. That was also observed by other labs since, um, especially the lab of, of Verena Ruprecht, who also, I mean, she was in the lab of Carfi Peisenberg at the time. Now she has her own lab, but she was the first author on the paper co published with ours uh, using uh, zebra fish embryos where they observe the same thing. Uh, if you look at actin in these cells, so this is, uh, for example, HeLa cells, uh, when they are adhesive with all the stress fibers, and they actually don't really move at this time scale of about 10 minutes. Uh, I know, sorry, that's not actin, that's myosin. So, but you see the same fibers. And that's when they are uh, in this uh, sausage state. And the main difference is that now uh, myosin, instead of forming these contractile bundles, form this flowing uh, network. Okay. So um, that was really our initial entry I mean, into this uh, question of stable blebs. And what we observed with these experiments is that. So basically, we have these two states. At high adhesion, cells migrate slow. They form these stress fibers. And they use basically this force to pull on the substrate. And at low adhesion, they could migrate fast. Their migration looks like amoeboid migration. And they uh, use the force to generate a pressure gradient and actomizing flow. And so mesenchymal cells can actually move like amoeboid cells, provided they don't adhere on the substrate and they're confined. So the uh, 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 next work we've done was to try to understand why confinement was triggering this uh, switch. And that was the work of Alexis Lomakin. I will go very rapidly over that just to give the, the main uh, result. So what we did in this work is that we collaborated with people uh, in Switzerland, Daniel Muller and Cédric Catin, who have this system of uh, IFM with a flat tip cantilever. So you can press the cell flat. Uh, and you can record the force and image the cell at the same time and deform it with a very precise uh, uh, step. Uh, and so the, the observation, the main observation that Alexis made is that when you deform a cell like that, so here you see the cell, the starting diameter is about 20 micron, then you press, it becomes like 10 micron high, press a bit more, it becomes five micron high here. It's, it's like, it really becomes like a pancake. And when you record the force, you see that the cell is not really uh, responding to the confinement. It is steps of one micron, one more micron. The force is in, uh, peaking, but then it's going back to a plateau. And then there is a transition where instead of having this plateau, you have the force is increasing. That means that the cell is pushing away the cantilever basically says enough squeezing and it's pushing back. Uh, and you can observe that this transition happens for different cells at different heights. Basically, when you reach six micron, almost all the cells have been starting to react. It's due, it's, so that's the amount of force that it uh, applies. This is myosin 2 dependent. If you treat with uh, raw kinase inhibitor, you have no force response. And here in these images of myosin 2 signal at the cell cortex, you can see that if you press the cell down to 10 micron, you have barely no cortical accumulation of myosin 2. But at 5 micron, in a couple of minutes, you see this nice uh, increase in myosin 2 at the cell periphery. This is also a reversible thing. If you remove uh, the confinement, then the myosin 2 goes back to, I mean, leaves the cortex and the contraction uh, stops. So we did a lot of work on that to understand where that was coming from. And we identified that the sensor of confinement was the nucleus that was triggering activation of the CPLA2 enzyme uh, when it was deformed, leading to uh, uh, acting contraction, actomizing contraction. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's published. And uh, so that's where Juanma uh, took this project. And uh, he, he started really to, uh, to 
ask more what are these uh, stable blades which are formed when cells are confined and mass in two activity is uh, increased. So he made movies where uh, he, he really was capturing the initial uh, very first uh, moments after confinement using this dynamic confiner system where he can image as he confines. And uh, so you could see that initially when you press on the cell, you form, maybe you see that at the beginning, you form blebs which are rather round, okay? Like the usual bleb you would expect from what is known from blebs. So basically membrane detachments. So there is no cortex there and it forms a bubble because of the pressure inside. But then after a certain uh, a few tens of seconds, you have an accumulation of actin and myosin at the cortex, and you start to see here, you see at the bottom, a bleb that instead of being round, is long, okay? And in this long bleb, you see these flows of actin and myosin, okay? These long blebs form, don't form if you inhibit CPLA2, meaning they need this activation of myosin 2 uh, to form. Uh, you can quantify this uh, recruitment of myosin 2 at the cortex, which is uh, some, in a way, a signature of its activation. Okay, you can see that it takes about 30 seconds after confinement. And you can quantify the shape of the blades which are formed. <clears throat> and you see, after about 15 seconds, you start to see uh, some blades which have an aspect ratio which is larger than three, meaning they are elongated, okay? They, you always have also rather round blebs, but they start to be like half of the bleb starts to be rather elongated after some time. And what is interesting is that these long blebs are also have a longer lifetime, meaning they are also more stable, okay? So it's not just a change in shape, it's also switch from a state which is a round bleb that would retract within a few tens of seconds to a bleb which is elongated and uh, lives longer. So if you look uh, at actomyosin dynamics in these two types of blebs, first on the left, you see a classical retractile bleb and you see that uh, it forms, so bare membrane, and then you have recruitment of actin on the whole membrane, and when actin uh, is fully, act actin cortex is fully formed and myosin starts to contract, it is basically retracting the bleb. That's a classical description of bleb, for example, by Guillaume Charles. In these elongated blebs, uh, something else is happening. What you see is that you initially have this bare membrane, okay? Uh, actually, uh, we look at the, I will stop the movies. And look here at this movie at the bottom. Uh, and then actin assembled on the cortex, but somehow it never reaches the tip. Okay. And myosin also never reaches the tip. And you get in this state where myosin contracts, but it is basically generating a flow instead of a retraction. So that's uh, ends up giving this uh, profile of actinomycin, where in a stable bleb you have a flat profile if you go around the periphery, while in a um, elongated stable bleb you have an, a gradient of actin and myosin. Okay. If you plot uh, these different um, uh, quantities in a, in a graph where each point is one bleb, uh, aspect ratio, actin polarity, so, and lifetime in a color code, you really see that you have these two populations of blebs. You have blebs which are short-lived, which have basically no actin polarity and are more or less round. And you have blebs which are long-lived and they are uh, polarized and they are elongated. So, and it looks like the transition is pretty sharp. There is not much in between. So look, it looks like there is a sort of of transition here, which is interesting to understand. Actually, if you look in time, the, the blebs, when they initially form, they are similar. Basically, they, are, they have a polarity because they have a front which is devoid of actin and myosin, and they are more or less round. Okay. 
Uh, and with time, they separate into these two classi classes. So when the, when the actomyosin flow starts, the, the blebs which will retract are still not polarized and round, while the blebs which will be stable are long and uh, polarized. Um, so that's actually, you can look, if you look at the, if you generate a PIV analysis of these movies, uh, you can detect the moment at which the actin flow, actomazin flow starts. Okay, here you see there is no retractile flow, and at one point all the arrows point to the back. You can do the same for a uh, stable bleb. Okay, here the flow is now starting. Okay, and if you plot uh, the time at which the flow starts versus the time at which um, the membrane stalls for, uh, I mean, stops protruding, you find uh, that for retractile blebs, you first have membrane stalling and then flow onset, and for stable blebs, you first have the flow onset. So basically, that gives a picture, which is rather simple. You could basically see it from the, from the movies. Uh, the distinction between the contractile bleb and the stable bleb is whether myosin starts to contract a cortex which has fully closed the membrane or a cortex which has left the front open. And if, if myosin starts to contract such a, a polarized actin cortex, when it contracts, it is basically removing the actin from the front. So it stabilizes this state. While if actin has time to populate the full membrane before myosin contracts. When myosin contracts, the whole bleb collapses, okay? Because you basically pull on the front. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, in, in retractile blebs, myosin pulls on the full cortex and this force is transmitted to the front membrane and it retracts the bleb, while in stable bleb, Myosin contraction is not transmitted to the front membrane. And so the contraction is actually retracting the actin cortex and not the bleb. So I think it's pretty clear on these images. So there is a, this first part, uh, really, we could learn that confinement induces uh, myosin 2 activation due to this nuclear ruler pathway. Activation of myosin 2 leads to an early onset of actin flow in blebs which are still elongating, and this only set of actin flow in elongated blebs prevents the retraction of the bleb and leads to the formation on these elongated and stable blebs. So, so that explains basically how you switch from a retractile to a stable bleb when you increase myosin act, uh, uh, activation, but it doesn't really explain why these stable blebs are elongated. Okay. So uh, that's what uh, Radma tried to understand by making uh, movies of uh, um, the actin cortex uh, in these blebs. And it turned out that uh, uh, there are a number of advantages that are unique to this, uh, and to this setup, which is uh, first that the cells are pressed against the cover slip due to the confinement, but they are pressed in an, on a non-adhesive cover slip. So it's quite unique uh, context, because usually the part of the cell which is against the cover slip is the adhesive part, if you don't confine. While well, here with the confinement, you can press a part of the cell that is not adhesive. So you can look at a non-adhesive cortex with a high NA turf, where you can resolve almost single actin filaments. Uh, and we also use ILA cells uh, which are expressing actin GFP in the genome. Uh, so you, in, with other actin markers we have tried and actually you don't get uh, at such a good contrast. You, it's harder to see single filaments. And that was done with, uh, for the imaging with uh, Stefan Wieser uh, in Barcelona and Verena Ruprecht also, also in, in Barcelona. So here you see basically uh, two cells uh, which are squeezed and you see all these stable blebs. Then you can focus on, on, on single stable blebs and you can see uh, this appearance, this nucleation of, of filaments at the front, 
which is followed. So here you see they populate the blab, they bind to each other. At one point, they get connected to the retractile part at the rear, and they are pulled backward, and then the blab front remains empty. Here you see about the same thing, another movie. You see here this part, which is pulled back, okay? Um, and you see the parts where you have sort of a bare membrane where actin filament can assemble before they connect to this moving flow. So when you see these movies, you can already have the feeling that you can understand something from them. I mean, it looks like you see the whole thing, you see the single filaments, you see how they bind to each other. So they are, they are pretty nice. I mean, I must say when I saw the movies, I thought, wow. And then we heard a bit like the wall of how do we quantify and we conceptualize what we see because that's very rich in, I mean, a lot of things are going on. Uh, how do we make sense of that? Except just saying, okay, we see uh, filaments appearing, being pulled back and so on. So that was a, a big work from, from Juanma to, to, to work on that, uh, to find ways to, to conceptualize that. So, so the first thing we, we can focus on is a bleb front, the bleb tip where there are very few actin filaments. So the, the first thing is uh, uh, these movies are answering is that uh, the, when, when we saw that, I mean, when you make a, just confocal movies, you see there, there is little actin filament at the front. You could even think it's empty. Actually, it's not empty. So you have actin to the front, but these filaments are the front. They are not connected to each other. And they are not connected to each other, not because they don't bind to each other, but because there are not many of them. Okay, so it's more you could imagine two scenarios why actin would not pull on the front of the blade. Either filaments are not sticking to each other, or there are just not enough filaments. So it seems that there is just not enough filaments. So you can you can actually. Uh, try to prove, I mean, we made efforts to prove that these are really single filaments at the front by imaging together actin GFP and uh, actin crosslinker uh, cross alpha actinin. And what you, you can see, for example, on this filament here, that here it, it gets a little bit uh, darker and that's actually just where you have alpha actin. So here our interpretation is that here you have a single filament and here you have two filaments. You can see that actually pretty well with uh, just analysis of intensity along this line. And what you can see really is that basically as uh, you have at the front single filaments and then they bind to each other and then you have recruitment of alpha actin. You can see if you compare the, the two images on top, top and back, basically you have here, you have multiple filaments, but here you have a single filament at the tip. So using that, we could a little bit look at, at really single filaments, which actually was really a first, uh, first time it was possible in a, in a living cell. Measuring things that I mean, are classical uh, in vitro, like uh, the speed of uh, the growth speed of actin filaments, the branching angle. Uh, you can see here a filament that uh, branches out of another one. It's a pretty slow, but you can see it here. Okay, and uh, and so you can find some uh, typical growth speed. The angle is expected from R to three, and uh, but that was interesting because that was really not seen before in in living cells. And uh, also uh, that the main thing that happens at the tip is just that filaments stick to each other. They are very sticky. So anytime they meet each other, basically they stick. Uh, that means that uh, what happened at the tip is that you have a spare, you have few filaments covered of cross linkers, and as soon as they touch each other, they bind to each other. Up. Um, so how do do we quantify all that? So. Uh, um, a way to, to quantify that is to, because there is a very good resolution, is simply to apply uh, thresholding to segment single filaments. And there you have basically uh, already a lot of parameters. You have 
the density of filaments, you have the flow uh, and you have the density of massing too. So when you analyze uh, these different things, you can plot them. Uh, so here it's for a single bleb uh, as a function of uh, the place in the bleb. And you can already see on this single example quite interesting things. So for example, here you have the, the PIV. So just the um, orientation of the flow and the speed of the flow. You see that already you have uh, a region at the tip, so where there is not really any oriented flow, then a region where all the arrows goes in the same direction to the back, and then the region at the back where the arrows converge. Okay. And here the speed is maximum here in the, min in the minimum. So from there, you can compute <coughs> the divergence, which tells you whether the um, uh, different arrows in the PIV go uh, are, are parallel or not parallel. And you see that in the center, you have this, uh, this region of where the divergence is zero. And at the back, it's negative. It's the, thing, the filaments are converging. So basically, here, zero divergence like that kind of already defines a network which is solid-like. Okay? So at the front, you have few filaments which jiggle around. It's more like a gas. At the back, it is contractile, negative divergence. And in the middle, it is like a solid. It's connected, but it doesn't move relative. The filaments don't, don't really move relative to each other. You can also see uh, the turnover of actin and myosin. You see that you have actin assembly uh, mostly uh, at the tip and in this region, and then this assembly at the back, that's expected. And you see that uh, the myosin is a little bit shifted. Uh, basically, myosin assembles on the network a little bit behind the actin. So that makes this region here, where you have uh, act, uh, actin, um, a high actin density, but no uh, myosin. So that now, that was also not easy. So I show these results, although they don't really uh, show anything very new, but they, that's, uh, that was a way to uh, average over many blebs uh, these sort of observations. So you have basically the actin densities at that, so you normalize to the bleb length uh, from the front going to the rear. You see that actin density is increasing while myosin density is not increasing. And then actin density kind of reaches a plateau, and there myosin density uh, increases. So that's the rear contractile rear. That's this intermediate region we will focus on because that's an interesting one. And there you have the transition from, I mean, the, basically a, a front that is lacking actin. And that's the analysis of the turnover. And here are the divergence uh, and the speed. And somehow uh, this divergence also is what I showed you on the single cell example is you have this large region where the divergence is close to zero, uh, meaning all, uh, I mean, it's, all the flow is going uh, parallel. So there is no contraction. So what you can uh, do also um, is uh, uh, make a measure that is uh, defining really uh, that this region is behaving like a solid, which is uh, the correlation length between the arrows in the flow. And what you see is that the front is totally uncorrelated, as you would expect for a gas. And then you reach this region in the middle where you have a very high correlation. Okay? Uh, and then the correlation goes back uh, when you reach the rear where you have the contraction. And you see that uh, here on an average over many uh, blebs where you see this transient intermediate solid-like region in the middle. So th that's the sort of image you can get what is happening to Akin in this bleb. You have these single filaments in the front assembling, sticking to each other to form a cross-linked network, but that is not yet contractile. And then my Zin2 that retracts this network, disassembles it, and also pulls it backward. So what we what seems very interesting is, is is actually the fact that you have two transitions. One transition here, which defines a transition to a fully connected network, which happens before the transition 
which defines the contract the contract time network. <clears throat> Uh, and so a, a transition to a fully connected network that transmits forces can be described by this theory of percolation, uh, which defines uh, the fact that the different elements are connected together physically. Okay? It can be applied to many different types of uh, areas uh, for different types of, of materials. So there are ways to, to characterize uh, this uh, percolation transition. And uh, what you need to, to do that is really to analyze the network of filaments. So for that, uh, what Juanma did is to skeletonize uh, the, the network, okay? And then to be able to define in this network which filaments are connected together or are alone. So the ones which are connected in continuity to the base are in blue, you can see here, and the red ones are the ones which are uh, in smaller network, either alone or in smaller networks which are not connected to, to the base. And so what you already see well with, uh, with that is that the, the fact that the filaments connect to this blue uh, large uh, uh, cross-link network defines whether they are pulled back or not. I mean, the red filaments, if you do a, a chymograph through the bleb, you see the red filaments, they basically are staying at the same place. And as soon as they connect, they become blue, they start to be pulled backward. Okay. So a way to, to, to know whether there is a percolation transition is to measure the size of the clusters which are formed by the filaments. You can uh, then define which one is the biggest clusters, which one is the second biggest cluster, the third biggest cluster. And uh, then what you expect is that as the density of filament increase, uh, that you can define by, define by the network density, all that is still on this single blade example. Huh? Uh, you will have the biggest clusters that wins over all the other and the second biggest that, that is losing. So that's, for example, for in vitro actin networks from uh, um, Alvarado et al. Uh, you see uh, this uh, nice transition, percolation transition. And there we can see that uh, in this blip. So how to do that in uh, averaging over many blebs? Uh, we, you, so again, uh, the idea is to define some parameters that you can average. So for example, the density of actin or the occupancy also of actin, which is so is basically the same parameter. Uh, I just uh, explain rapidly here. So here you have uh, um, in blue the occupancy. So the occupancy is from the skeletonized network is a fraction of the space which is occupied by white pixels or by pixels which are actin, uh, while the density is defined from the intensity of actin, so normalized intensity. So that's why here you see, in fact, that the occupancy around here reaches one, meaning the network is occupying the full space, uh, and then it cannot go higher, while the <clears throat> density keeps increasing, because the intensity keeps increasing, because you start to have several layers of actin. Okay? You can use that and you can uh, do it together with the analysis of the PIV. And then you can uh, average, I mean, you can cut your bleb in se se several uh, regions from the front to the tip. In each of the regions, you can define the occupancy. You can define whether the um, actin network is percolated or not, meaning all the filaments are connected together. And then you can plot percolation against occupancy, and you can see a nice, so the gray curve is actually the data from the experiment. And the theory predicts a sharp transition that the occupancy, the, the, the percolation should occur at a sharp transition of occupancy. You can also do the, this uh, analysis of largest and smallest cluster. And you see that at, the per, at the, here, the uh, occupancy threshold that defines the percolation you see that you have this divergence between the largest and the smallest cluster, the, small, the, uh, the largest cluster and the second largest, where the second largest goes down while the largest keep going up. That's a, a bit saying the same thing. 
So I'm not commenting this one. And then <clears throat> you can have a more direct proof of a, uh, the link between uh, this percolation threshold and the um, state of the active network by correlating this uh, density or occupancy analysis with the parameters that define whether the network is in a solid state or not, which are these correlation, correlation lengths or the local average of the mean cosine of the angle of the flow uh, from the PIV. And you see that you have these, uh, in, well, whether you use occupancy or density, which are actually uh, kind of related, uh, you can see this uh, transition uh, here in correlation lengths when you reach the uh, <laughs> density threshold or the occupancy threshold that defines the percolation uh, threshold. In this last one, uh, is more to relate uh, the, the density to this uh, diver divergence uh, uh, analysis. And you also see that you are in this state of zero divergence, so we're in this solid state, uh, where, when you are uh, close to the density threshold that defines the percolation threshold. Um, so that can be related to the work which has been done in vitro. Uh, by uh, the Kunderik lab. And uh, basically, what we find here is that in these, um, in these blades, you have a sequence of different states of the actin networks, which have been observed from in vitro work when varying different parameters uh, of the network. So here, basically, you can, they, they assemble from in vitro work this uh, phase diagram where you can, you have the two main parameters of the network, which are the network connectivity, which relate to the actin density and the motor activity, whether you have a lot or not a lot of motors. Okay. In this region where you have, uh, you are below the percolation threshold. Basically you have just a solution of filaments that move around, can be moved by, by motors, but uh, it, it stays uh, like a, in a gas-like state. If you increase the network connectivity, but you don't increase the motor activity, you reach a region where you have a gel. So all the network is co connected because you reach, uh, you cross the percolation threshold, but it's not contractile. And then if you go up in myosine concentration, if you go up from this connected network, you will get global contraction of the network. If you go up below the percolation transition, you will form local contraction and little asters, which have been observed, of course, uh, also in cells. And what we believe, and there you have the images of these different solution of actin in vitro, and they look very much like the different regions in the blend. So here we are in this state here where you have, you are below the, the uh, percolation transition. Then you reach the percolation transition, you form this solid-like state, which is not contractile, and then myosin concentration increase and you reach this third region. So basically, from the front of the bleb to the rear of the bleb, you go from one to two to three. You increase actin density, and then you increase myosin uh, density. <clears throat> So, and, and what we believe is that this, uh, sorry, this, uh, this explains actually the shape of the bleb, the elongated shape of the bleb. Because as you freeze the actin network, when you go from the state, the active solution state to the pre stress gel, you basically freeze the shape of the bleb until you reach the retractile region where you contract, okay? And that's why you have this region. So how can we test that? We can try to move this percolation transition down uh, in, the, in the bleb by, for example, reducing the uh, nucleation rate of actin. So myosin 2 arrives, starts to contract a non-percolated network. So that's what you can do by inhibiting, for example, R23 or formins, some nucleators. And then what you get, <coughs> get these sort of blebs, which are basically round. 
they have lost their uh, long straight part. <coughs> and uh, when Mazin contracts these networks, it forms this sort of asters. So then now you move, instead of moving from one to two to three, you move from one to four to three along the blade. Okay, so that's now if that's a little bit abstract and very quantitative, but I think that when you made this effort, maybe now when you look again at these movies, you see things in a little bit different way. And you see that what we, you actually see here is really these two sequential transition, here the percolation transition, here the contraction, that defines the existence, the shape and the stability of these blades. So we can observe three phases in the Aki network, the sparse gas like at the front, the solid in the middle and the contractile in the back. The solid phase exists because the percolation threshold is reached in a region that where there is not yet mazin contraction. So the region is not contractile and the rear contraction is pulling back the percolated region and it allows this system to stay dynamic. So that's actually some things we're exploring more on the theoretical side with Raphael Boiturier, because these percolated networks have been studied, but here what is very original is that this actin network forming the actin cortex should basically be at steady state in a frozen state with all the network percolated, but because you have these two sequential <coughs> transition from first the percolation, then the contraction, you are constantly pulling and clearing the, somehow removing the percolated region from the front and you make the system keep, uh, you, you maintain its dynamics, okay? So it was just, I, I'm exciting because that is the last thing I wanted to show. Um, here basically you can reproduce that uh, with simple uh, uh, simulation where you put this assembly of filaments, uh, they stick to each other and in the back they get pulled. So whenever they reach the percolation transition, if they reach the region where they are pulled up, you have this, you clean the, you clean the, <coughs> the top from the filament. Uh, so yeah, so that I, I would skip. So basically the, the only, then we looked a bit at what would happen when actin filament reaches the tip. Basically if actin filament reaches the tip, they pull on the tip either they glide <coughs> or they pull and they detach or they really retract the tip, okay? Uh, and uh, with that, we can explain generally the dynamics, the general dynamics we observe in, uh, in filaments, in uh, blades. <coughs> and uh, uh, so the, the question I wanted to finish with is with all this description of actin in uh, stable blades, can we understand, oh, sorry, understand with you, uh, something about amoeboid migration? Okay, because that was really our goal at the beginning, was not really to explain the shape of blebs <coughs> or why they are stable or why they are long. Now we understand why they are stable and why they are long, but do we understand something more about amoeboid migration? So it turns out that actually this bleb can move uh, whenever uh, these large pleb uh, de uh, detach from the main cell, they become autonomous motile fragments. And actually the dynamic of actin in these motile fragments is very similar uh, to what uh, you observe in the bleb when it's attached, so, except that now because it is not attached anymore, it can move away and it has this very persistent motion and you still, you see exactly like what I showed before, this free actin, this tip free of actin, then the assembly of the actin network, uh, then the retractile uh, rear, okay? And now because this babe move, you can really try to correlate uh, uh, the assembly of the actin in these blebs and their motion. So for that, we, uh, uh, Juan Ma used a, a procedure that has been defined years ago by the Danuser lab, where you analyze the bleb uh, contour, and along the contour, you analyze the displacement of the contour, and you analyze the uh, amount of actin. And so you get this sort of 2D graph <coughs> where you have the position along the contour and time, and for example here, the speed of the contour, and here you have the amount of actin. 
So when you have these two things, you can look at the correlation between the two. I mean, on these images is not obvious, but if you uh, been uh, for different actin density, you look at the same place at the velocity of the edge, there is a very clear uh, diagram where basically when you are below a very precise threshold of actin density, the, the, uh, the position of the bleb is protruding. Then above this uh, density, you are frozen, basically doesn't move. And below and above uh, another threshold, you start to contract. Okay, you retract the... So that really defines, uh, shows how <coughs> uh, this dynamic that we have observed in blebs. So this frozen region is basically, this is the, we interpret it as the percolation transition here, and here the contractile transition, okay? And that defines which part of the bleb extends, protrudes, which part is frozen, and which parts retracts. And actually from this analysis, we believe we actually have here a very nice motile machinery because we have a front that is basically devoid of actin and is soft and can uh, go through little holes. Then a percolated region that is solid and can anchor in the environment. And then a retractile here that disassembles the whole thing. So uh, we asked whether these things can really move through more complex network. So for that, Juanma confined, squeeze basically cells, but in a collagen gel. <coughs> if you squeeze these cells in a collagen gel, they still form blebs, but this time the blebs, uh, you see, and also blebs which can detach, but this time the blebs will, uh, move in collagen. And you see that they are super good at moving in collagen. And like I told you, actually, they are able to squeeze through uh, small holes. So if I start again the movie, you can see here, basically it is facing a, ridge, a wall of collagen. The front that is devoid of actin can insert here in a small hole. Then actin the percolation threshold is reached and actin solidifies in this hole and the rear retracts and so and that is happening everywhere okay so this is actually a perfect machine to move efficiently without adhesion through a dense network here you have another example that they are also very cool these movies up you see here it got stuck again here uh, uh, here in this uh, place and then it extruded the uh, actin free region here uh, to go through the hole <clears throat> you can do uh, you can map the displacement of the collagen and basically you get to this sort of image that you have uh, this pushing front this retractile rear and that's very similar to what you imagine for uh, an amoeboid motion and so just uh, a little bit for the sort of perspectives of this work for understanding uh, cell motility. Uh, you have uh, uh, these sort of motile cell fragments have been observed to form from cancer cells and they've been observed to form from blebs. So you see here that's a, from the lab of Matthew Krummel that's really in a mice, that's a cancer cell in a mice losing some fragments from blebs. Uh, and these fragments are after moving in the, away from the tumor and interacting with the immune system. So this way of forming motor fragments might be important in the context of these tumors. But also we think that more generally, I mean, these motile fragments are probably what is a immune moving an amoeboid cell. Here you see a neutrophil that is moving in a, in a micro channel. And as it goes from this large region of the channel to the small region of the channel, it is basically losing all actin at the front and transforming in a sort of large stable bleb. Okay. And uh, this is this transition <coughs> of actomazine from front to back has been observed by many people in my lab, but it's a 
project of Mathieu Degas. Uh, and uh, here you see it from neutrophils, from dendritic cells, from dicti. When the cells change, move in uh, environments which are more or less confined, they start to, in confined environments, they start to put all the actomazine at the back with a front totally devoid of actomazine. And basically, they switch to a sort of stable bleb motile state. That's what we believe. And that seems to be very universal um, capacity of cells. And in the end, what we want to understand <clears throat> from the beginning and what we hope we understand with this concept is uh, if you see these movies, this is actin density in uh, dendritic cells moving through a complex uh, network of channels. And uh, in the end, what you have is probably as simple as just a, a cortex with regions with weak, weak cortex where you have protrusion, then a solidification, and then region of contraction. And that gives you these uh, beautiful images, uh, which we don't understand yet. But for me, really, uh, this journey through the bleb somehow made me think that maybe we can understand them. And uh, with that, I'm done. Uh, this is um, this is uh, I mean, this is not uh, actually a very current picture of the lab, but you can see uh, Juan Ma, who did most of the work. Mathieu Degas, well, I showed what he did at the end. Actually, Asta also worked on these uh, cells in uh, in channels that I showed at the end. Uh, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mathieu. Uh, really beautiful movies and a uh, very cool story. Um, so uh, if you have any questions for Mathieu, please do use the, the raise hand thing and we can ask you to unmute or, or type it in the chat. Um, I'll just kick off myself. I was wondering what, would, what happens if you increase the myosin in a stable bleb? Does, it, does the zone of the percolation region reduce and therefore you change the shape or, or what happens there? If we could move the, so that uh, we have not, so basically if you could move myosin up the bleb, <clears throat> uh, you should reach, if you make it move uh, far enough, I mean, you should get, uh, you should totally get rid of this uh, percolated region. And so you should start to contract uh, non-percolated regions. So to form these, uh, uh, these little asters and have a round bleb, but that would not necessarily retract the bleb. You, what you need is to retract the bleb is to have the percolation threshold reaching the tip. Basically, you have to percolate actin up to the tip. Cool, thank you. Jen? Yep, great. Um, before we go into the questions, Matthew, are you okay to stay um, a few minutes longer? I can already tell we're going to go past the hour mark. Is that all right with you? Yeah, it's fine with me. Okay, great. Um, so from uh, Niels Gauthier, uh, two questions. The first one, did you incorporate hydrostatic pressure and surface area availability in the long versus short hemispherical bleb dynamics? Oh yeah, no, we, we, we have not measured that, but uh, that these are important parameters, of course. So the, for the pressure, they are really, I mean, one question is really whether the pressure comes <coughs> from the mother cell or is self-generated by the bleb. And clearly from the fact that there can be stable blebs that detach from the mother cell and keep moving uh, totally autonomously for hours, I mean, maybe the initial trigger is from the contraction of the, of the main cell body that detach, that forms the bleb. But once the machinery is set and you get in this state with the, in this stable state, uh, this is autonomous and the pressure is generated by the rear contraction. That's what we believe, but we have not measured any of this pressure. Maybe with shape analysis, we could have some idea, but we have not measured. And then the other was the membrane availability. That's a very good question. We discussed that, but we didn't uh, really do anything on that. Uh, from the work of Erez Ras, for example, uh, it seems that you have, when you have formation of a bleb, you first use the membrane that is there in folds, okay? Uh, but then these blebs, they grow huge. So very likely they pull membrane from the mother cell too. 
Great, great. And the second question from uh, from Nils is, um, what's the balanced role of foremans and ARP 2.3 in the system? Yeah. So here we did we have not really observed any uh, specific role of ARP 2.3 of foremans, or whether you inhibit one or the other, the phenotype is pretty much the same. You get less active nucleation and you lose this percolated region. So basically you get uh, you get a network that becomes contractile before it percolates. And so you have a more roundish bleb uh, with uh, forming these sort of asters instead of forming these uh, uh, percolated network, which we believe is important. I think we see, in fact, actually, we really, we believe that this percolated network is very, might have a very important role in migration to complex environment, although we have not done a lot of work on that yet. Because you imagine you, you could have a front that is basically soft, devoid of a cortex, moves through a little hole, but then you percolate and you kind of form a sort of anchor because you solidify this network in the shape of the collagen gel. And then you can hold that to move forward without forming any specific adhesion. Okay, So that's why we think it's important to have this intermediate percolated solid-like region because otherwise, if everything is fluid, if you start to pull on the network before it percolates, uh, you will not be able really to grab uh, on the collagen network. Okay. I see uh, that a lot of, of hands raised, but I don't know how you did. I let you deal with yeah. that. Uh, yeah, Shashank, you're next. Um, hi, Matthew. Great talk Hello. as usual. Uh, the question I had, I mean, I absolutely loved your movies about the single filaments and some of the first demonstration that I see of individual filaments growing and uh, doing the thing. Did you see any evidence at all of them disassembling? And I'm pretty agnostic with, you know, fragmentation, depolymerization. Do you see any disassembly of individual filaments before? Not really, uh, uh, because actually in the front uh, part of the bleb, it's really mostly uh, as elongation uh, cross-linking, it looks like uh, you have uh, even in some, uh, I mean, there are lots of things to look at probably there in more details for people like you. Uh, but so you can see uh, actually what when the filaments get pulled on, you can see filaments that break. Mm -hmm. uh, but we have not really seen any disassembly or maybe we have not looked specifically for that, but at the front is really more assembly and uh, bundling. Right, going on. Okay, now I think that one thing that was interesting we was bit, uh, we have a bit this idea that it looks like uh, the filaments that come in the front, and we see that also in some perturbation from or when we perturbe uh, uh, ezrin, radixin, moesin type of proteins. I didn't really describe that. Uh, it's really like little fragments. Mm. A lot of it looks like you have a lot of little fragments that fall on the membrane, and then elongates and bundle. I see. Rather I see. than really nucleation from zero. So it I could see. be that in these blebs, you have like this network that gets broken in little pieces and these little pieces reassemble at the front. Right, and that, that's where severing or fragmentation could be coming in. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you. But yeah, I don't know more precisely. Fantastic. Um, Michael, you've had your hand up for a while. Please go ahead. Yeah, that was awesome that too. Um, so, the impression I get from looking at the movies is that um, the protrusion sort of happens when you get a bleb on top of a bleb. And mm -hmm. I was wondering whether, A, is there some geometry about the blebs that tend to bleb? And are there ways that you can tune the cytoskeleton so that none of the blebs actually break out into this stable configuration that you've so nicely demonstrated? Yeah, uh, so yeah, we can see bleb on blebs. Uh, basically, I mean, all these dynamics is really kind of stochastic and depends on uh, uh, the rate at which actin assembles versus the rate at which the membrane extends, I mean, the, the protrusion extends. So if you have, uh, so when you have actin assembly and you start to get for any reason, for example, you have a wall and the membrane cannot move anymore. This gets populated by actin, okay, uh, very fast, and that, that gets retracted. 
And, but you have that stochastically also in a free blade because some actin filaments are able to, to reach the end and get and are connected through the, the back to the back and then they start to pull on the membrane and that deforms the front, okay? And can then you have, I didn't spend a lot of time on that, but you have basically, sometimes you have filaments that slide, okay? And then it gives the impression that the, the bubble at the front is, is moving from one side to the next, for example. Uh, so you have this weird sort of winding motion of the front. And then you really have sometimes some stalling. So, but the pressure generated by the bags, the back is still contractile and generates enough pressure to detach the membrane again. And then you start to have this bleb and bleb instability. And that depends really, I think, on very fine uh, parameters. So what you can do to have only stable blebs is to reduce the actin membrane binding. So that we did with uh, inhibiting uh, ezrin, radixin, moezin, ERM, uh, generally ERM inhibitor. And then basically your blebs become very standard, stable. You never get these events of uh, in bleb on bleb or this kind of thing. Uh, what you would do to prevent, so what you asked is if it would be possible to totally prevent the, the, the formation of stable blebs. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Like I was wondering if, if the myosin, with slightly reduced myosin levels, whether the yeah. actin would have so a chance to guess, catch up. Just, yeah, just reducing myosin level, you, 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 it's enough to to avoid the stable blood formation. So. Awesome. Thank you. Rekal? Yeah, thank you, Mathieu, for the talk. Um, my question is actually related, which is, that um, you know, for this blebs to continue moving, you need myosin to be at the rear. And so I wonder if you know why myosin doesn't reach the tip of the bleb. Is it based on the diffusion of myosin or is it based on some kinetics of assembly? Yeah, so that can be actually also, I mean, one man at one point wanted to, to push that further, but I told him that I, was, I wanted to, him to do something else. But. Uh, but really, I think you have three things that contribute to that. First, the myosin filaments are pretty big, so they don't diffuse very fast to, to the tip. Then they get captured by the actin network, and as soon as they get captured by the actin network, they get flown backward. Mm -hmm. Okay, So basically, okay. they organize their own depletion. Mm -hmm. The flow that they generate depletes the front. Okay, But you could say it's the same for actin. Except so, uh, probably the actin elements uh, diffuse further than the myosin filaments. And then you have, phenomenon, you have a phenomenon also, which is how myosin assembles on actin to form contractile structures. And that doesn't seem to be like just one filament falling on the actin network. So from the analysis of the myosin fossa, you really have a sort of assembly phenomenon uh, where you have to reach a certain amount of actin, of uh, myosin, sorry, to start to form a contractile structure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you have Thank all you. these things contribute. Uh, yeah, you have a sort of non-linearity. You have the flow that depletes the myosin, and you have a non-linearity in the assembly of the on the contractile structure that makes that it forms uh, just at the back. Cool. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, we're going to take a question. Um, from coming from our YouTube audience. So um, Andrea Rafazio um, asks two questions. First, uh, saying hydrostatic pressure should play a role to protrude the blebs forward. Have you observed any interior grade flow? Uh, you mean uh, inside the bleb? Uh, yes, you have, of course, some, uh, if you look at, in the US, you can see that if you look at, uh, you cannot see that from myosin or actin staining but you can see some little vesicles or little structure inside that, that move forward, yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's more in the, in the middle of the bleb, let's say. And most of the movies I showed are really the surface where the actomyosin is moving back. And actually probably anything that touches the surface is moved backward, but in the middle, you have a flow to the front, toward the front. Um, and uh, yes, the pressure plays a role. For example, Juan Ma did uh, an experiment, which is quite nice, I didn't show, where he, he, on, he, he can, so you have the, basically these cells which are in this blebbing state, they form both retractile and stable blebs. 
and then you can press a little more, like transiently press a little bit. So when you do that, basically you pressurize all the blades. And what you see is that you turn all the, all the stable blades into, uh, all the retractile blades into stable blades. So basically by this extra pressure, you detach the membranes on all the blades and you, you switch to this uh, state, they automatically switch to this state where uh, they, they are in this stable state, even when you stop adding more pressure. Okay, because then they, they switch to this state where the, the myosin is, put, is retracting the actin and that's a stable state actually. Okay. Great, and we have a second one from Andrea um, saying that the bleb contains or gives the impression of being a self-contained system quite isolated from the cell body. So how mm -hmm. are the blebs providing motility to the cell and what kind of structure is connecting um, at the bleb's neck to transduce forces mm -hmm. to the cell's body? Yeah. So first, uh, these sort of stable blebs, um, they, they can detach and then they form, they are clearly autonomous motile structures. But in the state, I mean, it really depends uh, whether they move alone or whether they move with the whole cell, it really depends on the balance of force on the cell body and on the bleb. So some, somehow they produce a certain amount of force with the substrate. But if the cell body is kind of stuck, it's not strong enough to move the cell body. And then it, it will move away and, and rupture from the cell body and from this fragment. But if the cell body is not adhered, I mean, if you really have a low adhesion, the, the motile force produced by the bleb is enough to pull the whole cell. Also, what we observed, which I did not describe a lot here, is that with time, all these blebs that are around the cell Somehow, that's something yeah, we've not really worked on, but there seem to be a sort of competition or polarization process. But at one point, there is basically one big bleb that wins over all the others. Okay. And this big bleb is so big that it's almost, I mean, if you have played again, is like larger than the cell body. Like a lot of the cell body is moving into this very stable bleb. Uh, even in many cases, even the nucleus moves in the bleb. Okay. And then that's this transition that I was showing to this sausage state where actually now the whole cell is a bleb. And the, the, what is a remnant of the cell body is, looks like more like a europod, you know, that was described. So that's more like a <coughs> global polarization process. And that turns into a motile, entire motile cell. But when you are in this stage where you form a lot of uh, small blebs, this none of these small bleb will be strong enough to pull the whole cell. Okay. And, but they can detach and form autonomous motile structures. Thanks. A uh, question from Akangshi is asking whether there's polarity of formins to the front, and if so, why? And what regulates the density of actin in the contractile zone? Is it myosin 2 dependent yeah. depolymerization or something else? Yeah, so, so these are very good questions for which we don't really have an answer, but we can, we can analyze the turnover of actin from the actin density. And that gives us somehow where you have more assembly and more disassembly, but we don't really know what are the factors generating that. So somehow we see this assembly, <coughs> which is more at the front and is also increasing. It's not only at the very front, it's basically also there in the middle, clearly there is assembly everywhere there. Okay. It's just that at the front you see it better because there is no other filament, but the assembly is also there. I mean, the filaments keep growing also as they move backward. And then in the very rear, you have this net disassembly. And the most likely explanation is a myosin contraction that breaks uh, the filament that has been proposed in vitro already by many groups like. Uh, um, for, I mean, uh, really just the, the myosin contraction rupturing the filaments. Of course, there can be other factors uh, severing uh, proteins that increase the turnover. We have not tested any of that. Also, important thing, we would be nice to understand whether capping protein plays a role there because clearly the filament stability is important, but we have not looked at that. I mean, for, from, from all that, what seems to be really a major factor so basically you need assembly 
So you need uh, nucleators. If you decrease assembly, you, you will not reach the percolation threshold before the contraction. And so you, you lose this uh, solid like state. So you need fast enough assembly. You need contraction to pull the whole thing back and to disassemble. And the important, third important, so that's not new, but this very important element uh, is you need uh, actin bundling. So basically, the fact that actin bundling is very efficient here, as soon, we observe that as soon as two filaments touch, they, they bundle together. Uh, is also uh, explains why, I mean, also in previous reports, people have identified uh, bundling, I mean, actin bundlers, cross-linking uh, proteins as essential for the formation of stable blades. And actually, they are also very important in general for motility of amoeboid cells, which also kind of maybe uh, suggest that our analogy between stable blades and amoeboid cells maybe is, uh, is, is correct. Okay, fantastic. And actually, I think uh, this is a good follow-up question to that from um, Niha Petalaya uh, is asking if the distribution of the at acting, actin network, sorry, from the front to the back of the bleb, is that due to the distribution of the actin severing factors in these different regions? Uh, there might be, I mean, actually, because there is actomyosin flow, you can imagine that there is a polarization of many things. So there are two things that can generate uh, polarization, the flow by, trans by convection, okay? And then the, the fact that you have a different occupancy of the membrane at front and back. So when you have a bare membrane, you could have a number of factors that go there that uh, are activated when there is no actin. And then when it's populated by actin, it uh, gets inhibited, okay? So you have two things, the, the flow, uh, can ge really generate a segregation. And so you can have polarity of many things. You can imagine that many factors are polarized. Also uh, signaling molecules, you know, that's something we are not, we have not been studying with one map, but in other labs, people are studying that. Uh, like raw GTPases and so on, uh, might form gradients there. And downstream, you could have gradients of, uh, assembly, gradients of contraction, gradients of, uh, of severing factors. But we have not uh, looked at that here. And from, from our analysis, you don't need to have a gradient of severing factors to, for, for, the, for this system to work. Uh, you need to have severing for sure, but uh, you don't need a, a gradient of severing. In fact, Thanks. we are working uh, on, on the modeling, on the model aspect with Rafael Guattieri, but it's not here that. So there are certain facts, certain things that came out of the model from like being really essential for, for that to work, but, but uh, it's not yet finished. Thanks. We've got about two or three questions left, if that's okay, Mathieu. Okay, that's nice. Okay. Uh, we've got a question about whether the, whether the nucleus is translocated into the fragment. So, so as I said, it can happen, uh, especially uh, on long term, when the, when you have this uh, somehow polarization of the cell, which form the unique very large bleb. Uh, very often, the, the nucleus gets inserted in this bleb, or at least gets stuck in the neck. Uh, we even wondered at one point with one ma if that if the was a factor uh, deciding which bleb would be would end up being the main driving bleb uh, because the nucleus get, uh, get there. But we have not pursued that analysis further. But yes, in fact, actually, you, you, can, have, you can have a lot of funny situations. Uh, if, for example, mitotic cells, they can start to form these blebs uh, when, while they have a mitotic spindle. So it, the cell becomes totally messed up, the spindle messed up, chromosomes everywhere. And then you see a fragment living, a motile fragment with a chromosome inside alone. <laughs> so you can have this sort of situation uh, where you, this motile fragment, they have one chromosome. So I, I don't mean there might be totally no relevance of that for any physiological process at all. Huh? But uh, 
what I mean is that, yeah, you can have, I mean, if you imagine, like if you, when you see these movies from tumor cells from uh, the Krummel lab, I mean, these tumor cells, they are in this very shaky state where they form all these blebs, they lose, they lose pieces. These pieces they actually move away. They get eaten by immune cells that generate specific signaling. Maybe some of it comes from the DNA too that they carry or not. I mean, so I, I think actually in vivo, you probably have even much more wild uh, situation than we can recapitulate in vitro. So I tend to think that anything we see in vitro happens somewhere uh, in vivo too. <laughs> the question is where and in which uh, context, I mean. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. Um, we have two questions from uh, Suvam Mukherjee. Uh, first, saying that we know blood formation is accompanied by apoptosis, but apart from that, what are the other significance that uh, is provided by these stable blebs? No, it's rather that apoptosis is accompanied by blood formation than the opposite. I mean, because apoptosis triggers myosin activation. Okay, and then cells start to bleb. Uh, so other situation, you have uh, blebbing during mitosis. It's been proposed to stabilize the uh, furo by releasing pressure at the tips. You have, of course, blebbing during migration. So we have here Erez Raz, who is a big specialist of uh, uh, bleb I mean, function during migration of immune cells. Uh, in a specific system in the zebrafish, but it's, uh, it's very clearly demonstrated there. Uh, and uh, we believe yeah, that that can be actually, I'm not sure whether immune cells are not really I mean, necessarily using blebs to move, but I think they are like a big bleb. They can be in a state that is just using the same principle of motion that we see in these large blebs. Meaning, uh, like um, this, uh, this sequential transition of state with a front devoid of actin, <coughs> then a, a solid actin state, then a contractile contract, uh, contraction at the back. Okay, great. And then the, just a second quick question from Suvam, uh, wondering if um, you were using blebistatin as, as a control since it inhibits bleb formation in all of your experiments. No, uh, in fact, if you use blebistatin, really you have no bleb at all. So uh, you cannot study these blebs with blebistatin. Uh, actually, you can uh, reduce contractility slightly, uh, and then you mostly have round blebs. You inhibit, you don't inhibit the long blebs. You inhibit, sorry, just the long blebs, but you still have the round blebs if you don't have enough contractility. So with Y27, if you don't put too much or with CPLA2 inhibition uh, or with a little bit of lebistatin, probably you would have the same. I don't think we did this experiment. What we did in the first work was to add lebistatin uh, after the blebs were formed. And then uh, what you have is the whole flow is stop, stops and the bleb uh, disappears. Thanks. Uh, Leon's asking whether the data you presented suggests that the Brownian rapture isn't functioning in amoeboid migration. So Brownian ratchet meaning the assembly of actin pushing the membrane. So if yes, that's, that's what right, it yeah. means. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, so, so yeah, there is this basically, I think, uh, yeah, they, I mean, the, the paradigm has been for a long time that uh, at least in Lamellipodia, uh, actin assembly was pushing the membrane forward. Now there are evidence even for cells moving with lamellipodia that is not clearly the case. It's more than actin populates the, the space that is free when the move membrane uh, is pushed forward, but maybe the membrane is pushed forward more by hydrostatic pressure than by the actin itself. And that in general, actin is more holding the membrane. So in bleb, in bleb migration is very clear. I mean, actin is holding the membrane. And basically, the blood protrudes when actin is not attached to the membrane. So in this context, yes, it's not a bony and ratchet. Oh. Great, fantastic. Um, and yeah, we still have um, a few more, but just let us know if, if, you, um, if you have to go. Um, 
So from uh, Mohammed, two very important questions. The first one being, what's the name of your cat? Which I would also like uh, to know. I use my cat. <laughs> my cat and is, um, also. Uh, yeah, sorry. I didn't very put cute. the background. Is she, she's called a galipet. I don't even know how to translate that in English. Galipet is when you roll over your head. You know, like kids, they like to roll like that. So that's her name. Uh, um, and the second question? <laughs> yes. Uh, well, the less important one, of course. Um, just wondering if the viability of the fragments is different among different types of cells. Uh, viability in terms of how long they live once they have been released? Yeah. Uh, I have no idea about that. I would say that probably different fragments, I mean, that's been studied in different systems. For, for example, people have produced fragments in many ways uh, uh, by enucleation, by some different ways of fragmenting cells. Uh, very often the fragments, they live for 24 to 48 hours, probably depending on what they have inside. Uh, usually they contain mitochondria and all that kind of thing, so that, that makes them live quite long, actually. But I don't know if there are, it's known if it depends on the cell type. But there are many of these fragments here. It's, they are called people, yeah, there are different names, cytokineplast or, yeah. Thanks. Uh, Rina was asking uh, about if the stability of the actin filaments varies through the through the bleb, like if they were decorated by different tropomyosins. That we have no idea. Actually, we don't really see, as I said, much filament disassembly. So it looks like actually they are very stable. It's really different from, yeah, what you would expect from some in vitro situations where you have both assembly and disassembly. Uh, but here, really, uh, at least in the region where you can see single filaments, they are all either stable or growing. They don't disassemble. Okay, fantastic. Um, Erez, we saw that you had you're unmuted for a sec. Did you want to? Um, did you have a question? Just, uh, just a comment. It was a comment when uh, we talked about the ability of the nucleus or parts of it to get into the bleb. So at least in our system of the germ cells at the neck of the, so the, the separation of the uh, membrane from the actin occurs. And then you are, for some time you're left with an actin belt. And this is actually something that uh, we assume stops the nucleus from getting into the bleb and avoid uh, you know, loss of uh, chromosomes and so, so on. So, at least in our cells, you, under normal conditions, you don't have it. So it's really, there's a cage that doesn't, doesn't let the nucleus pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in these, uh, in these long lasting blabbing situations, it can happen, but of course, most of the time it doesn't happen either. I mean, you don't get the, the nucleus in the blab, but if you, you can have situation where it goes in the blab eventually, I don't know exactly why. I don't know if it's relevant. Either. Yeah, just if you if it would happen uh, a lot, you it would not be a good thing. So again, at least in our cells, the the actin that is left behind as the bleb yeah, yeah. Uh, goes on is just stopping it. So it it will, yeah. I think, and rarely in happen. Bleb, you, you even have a, you even have a sort of neck actually where where the actomyosin uh, really concentrates. It forms this neck region, which I guess is very constricted and hard to pass for the nucleus. Yeah. I mean, it is, I mean, the cells we work on, you really don't want to lose, if it's germ cells, you really don't want to lose parts of the chromosome. So maybe that's mm -hmm. even more astringent there. But. Mm -hmm. Right, fantastic. Um, I think we're to our last question um, from William, um, who wants to know if you've looked at membrane fluidity at the bleb tip uh, relative to the rest of the plasma membrane. No, not at all. But it's a very good question. Actually, yeah, in general, I, I really wonder how this membrane fluidity or also how the membrane is extruded from the main cell body to form these very large blebs. Because as I said, initially, probably it just comes from folds, but then it grows so big that, that it cannot be just from folds on the membrane. 
and uh, this membrane has to go to the neck of the bleb and very likely it's limiting uh, the expansion of the blebs. So that would be quite interesting yeah, to know more about that. That's also something that one more was interesting at one moment, but we, we have not done any experiment on that. All right, fantastic. Um, I thank you so, so much, uh, Matthew, for uh, staying an extra half hour to answer all these wonderful questions everyone has had. Um, and with that, I think we're going to wrap up for today and for the season. So um, big thank you to all of our speakers and especially to all of the participants because um, the fact that we have such a great audience who ask great questions is I think what makes this um, series so awesome. So um, thank you to everyone. I'm gonna go ahead and um, kill the live stream and um, we'll see you all soon. Um, if you're not on our mailing list, um, go to sellmigrationseminars.com and you can sign up and then you'll be notified when we're starting up